okay. or in Japan, whatever, but I've run into you a couple of times. But I'm, 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 it's too bad. Well, I'm, welcome back. It's too bad you're not in government. Welcome now. back to the second uh, panel of our session today. Thank you for joining us. Again, I'm Jim Schof. I'm a senior fellow here in the Asia program at Carnegie. And it's my pleasure to, to be the moderator for the second session. Uh, very appreciative of our first panel and General Ayer's contributions. Um, our first panel was able to talk about and got to the issue of what needs to be done or what can be done or what, what are some of the options of what uh, has to happen uh, going forward. I think uh, if I'm going to characterize our session uh, now, it's, it's really about uh, how do we make that happen? And what are some of the trade-offs in terms of the different approaches we could take to help make that happen? Uh, the art of diplomacy, as it were, but also importantly as a theme for today's program is looking at this and doing this in an alliance context. Um, in a private session we had yesterday, uh, you know, one of the comments, we, we broke it up into assessments and goals and priorities and then looking at uh, trade-offs. And you know, one member emphasized the goal of uh, that a key goal at the end of this process should be uh, uh, remainingly uh, strong alliance relations because of the value of, of that relationship. And uh, so keeping that in mind as we think about these different trade-offs, I think, is, is very important. And that's with both uh, Japan and with South Korea for, for the United States. Um, so to join us uh, here for this panel, uh, we're very pleased to have um, Ambassador Sasai, uh, Kenichiro Sasai, who is now no longer the ambassador to, to Washington, no longer the uh, vice foreign minister or director general of Asian affairs in uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he was uh, thoroughly involved uh, in the six party talks and a, and a leader, a representative for Japan in, in previous negotiations uh, with North Korea. He is now the president of the Japan Institute of International Affairs in Tokyo. Congratulations on your, uh, your new assignment and, and welcome back in a more kind of relaxed and less uh, demanding role here, hopefully. Uh, thank you for having <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And we're also welcoming back to Washington uh, on my left, Susan Thornton, uh, who uh, was until very recently uh, the Acting Assistant Secretary for East Asia at the State Department. And uh, I was just joking with a, a, a friend, we were talking about that you're no longer at Maine State, you're now in Maine State. Hey. Um, <laughs> because uh, uh, she's uh, spending a lot of time in the state of Maine, uh, uh, where she uh, keeps tabs on, on what's going on here in, in Washington uh, from afar. And, uh, but she has a lot of experience uh, in Asia. She uh, uh, joined the State Department in 91 and spent the last 20 years working on U.S. policy uh, in Eurasia and, and in Asia, former Soviet Union, and with a particular emphasis in China. She was uh, DCM in Turkmenistan and, and uh, posted in Beijing and Chengdu uh, and elsewhere. Uh, we also have uh, on my far left, uh, Chung Min Lee, uh, who's a senior fellow here at the Carnegie Endowment in the Asia program. He runs our Inside Korea program, a uh, relatively new program. He had been a, a professor for many years at Yonsei University uh, in Seoul. And from 2013 to 2016, he was the, uh, served as ambassador for national security affairs. Uh, for South Korea, uh, a dear friend, and uh, we're very lucky to have him here in Washington. And then also, we're, we're bringing a lot of Carnegie uh, firepower here today. Uh, Suzanne DiMaggio, uh, on my far right, uh, is um, a senior fellow here at Carnegie now, uh, where she focuses on US foreign policy toward the Middle East and Asia. She's famous uh, and has uh, for leading a series of track two dialogues and various dialogues with uh, both Iran and North Korea. Uh, coming at very difficult and challenging diplomatic issues uh, in a, through a, a collective dialogue. And, and uh, we're really pleased that Suzanne is now part of the team uh, joining us from uh, New America. And she had also previously worked at the uh, Asia Society. Um, there's an empty chair, and it's there for a reason, because when we get to the uh, Q&A portion of our, our dialogue, uh, we're going to invite uh, General Ayer to come back up, because uh, some of, of the things I think we're going to talk about will get to the issue of trade-offs and, and what, do we, what do we give or what are we prepared to give North Korea to build uh, confidence, to build trust and stability. 
uh, as, as was discussed earlier, and that could have very direct bearings on UN command and, and, and other issues. So we want to bring that uh, voice into it. But I'm going to start, before we get into what we're willing to give, um, I'd like to start a little bit with what do we want to get um, from North Korea in, in this process? And I'll, I'll start with our senior diplomats here, but I'm, I'm encouraging uh, active discussion and dialogue and participation from everybody. Uh, but Japan in particular uh, has been notable for uh, emphasizing the whole package, for really saying that we need to not only focus on nuclear weapons and the nuclear program, but it should be missiles, and not only ICBMs, but also other ranges of missiles and the ChemBio program and uh, other WMD, and notably uh, res resolving the uh, abductee issue of Japanese who had been abducted by North Korea uh, many years ago and has still not uh, been resolved. So if, if we think of, if we're really striving for real and lasting peace and security in the region, I think this is the right list uh, to, to pursue. But objectively speaking, it, it doesn't seem that we, we have quite sufficient pressure or leverage uh, at the moment to realize all of these demands. Um, so I want to uh, ask, maybe start out with, is it, is it right to kind of put all these things on the table from the very beginning uh, in terms of our discussions with the North Koreans? Um, and if, if, we, if we have to put them in some kind of sequence or, or priority, what is the, the, a good way or the right way to think about that, both from Japan's perspective and, and from the U.S. perspective. So, Ambassador, I'm going to put you on the spot um, first, maybe, to help get us okay. going on that. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, it's nice to come back to Washington where you could have a freedom to speech. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> well, of course, we do have a freedom. Right, of exactly. We, we pride ourselves. Our, yeah, as a private <laughs> citizen of the Thor. Well, uh, you know, uh, what is the uh, goal of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the pictures uh, we like to get? Uh, of course, this uh, denuclearization is the most uh, pressing issue for all of us, that is clear, in terms of, uh, you know, pressing uh, threat coming on to us. But when you go on on this uh, denuclearization negotiation talks, Obviously, there is issue, issues of confidence. People are talking about, uh, you know, confidence gap of the thought. And uh, as we move on, obviously, you have a doubt about the intention of the others and so forth. Then there is other process which would help. Uh, for example, when we had a sixth party talk, people believe that was a failure because that didn't really get us to anywhere at the end. But I think when we started this process uh, back in 2005, I think the, the debate we had with uh, Chinese and even the United States at the time was, uh, what is the end state? Uh, what's the picture we are working on at the end? Just you know, getting rid of nuclear weapon is sufficient for the peace and stability of the peninsula. And that's uh, getting rid of nuclear weapon is a very important, essential element of confidence building. But that's not enough, because I think you might still think that North Koreans might choose a missile, right, without any nuclear weapon. That is also a challenge to us. And what about the fundamental relationship, including some other, you know, uh, conventional weapon somebody was addressed. Uh, uh, what are the uh, end states? So I think uh, we uh, try to work on the elements, not necessarily the whole picture, but elements of what we are trying to get, whether it is uh, nuclear weapons, whether it is a normalization, whether it is a economic assistance program, whether it is an energy assistance program, or whether it is a lifting sanctions, uh, whether it is a security guarantees, or a whole bunch of the elements which we might discuss as a part of all overall ending game. Without that one, we just uh, talk on the uh, nuclear issues. We move inch by inch, beyond bomb facilities, and uh, we are not sure that uh, how much North Koreans are willing to cover. And, uh, and then uh, even if we get this done, 
what are the missile issues? Uh, can we normalize the relationship? We've done nothing. So I think that was this idea, at least, even without agreeing all the details, what should be the major element we need to address in order to secure the final peace and stability of the Korean, Korean Peninsula. I think that was the whole idea. Yeah. So my uh, J Japan basic approach is that we need to look at the issues in a holistic way, not simply because we don't think that uh, this denuclearization is not important. That would continue to be essential part and prioritized part, but don't forget that at the end of the game, we need to cover other issues because as you move on this uh, talk, you tend to forget. Uh, like, uh, you know, Iranian deal. We didn't forget. People thought that this behavior to support Hezbollah and others. People said it's not enough. We can't uh, trust Iran. So uh, I don't say the situation is the same. I think we don't have much trust between each other. That's why I, I'm saying that we need to approach the issue in a comprehensive way so that one day uh, either one of us would uh, would pull the leg. Right, right. No, that's a good point. Susan, what about from the U.S. perspective? And this can be just your own thoughts, but mm -hmm. obviously you have some insight into to what Washington and the Trump administration is thinking about what it wants to get or how it outlines its priorities in this process. Mm -hmm. Much, Jim, and thanks to Carnegie for having me here. It's great to be back in Washington, and I feel a little bit probably like Ambassador Sasai does, a little bit unshackled and um, a little bit freer to think about sort of what, you know, if given more free reign, you know, we could do. Um, you know, I started working on North Korea during the days of the agreed framework, and, um, you know, many, many, many of the issues that have been existing in trying to deal with this problem. Not only do they still exist, but they've gotten kind of more complicated. So as a diplomat, I am extremely supportive now of the effort underway to try to resolve this issue diplomatically. And people have you know, complained about um, how the process is going, how it's been uh, undertaken, et cetera. But I think first and foremost, we absolutely have to see that there's an opportunity here to test out, are the North Koreans, have they changed their mind about something fundamental? Does Kim Jong-un have a fundamentally different approach? And we have to test it. Of course, there's no trust. And I thought uh, the general's comments about uh, some of the problems we're having in keeping all, all of our partners and allies aligned on the, on the tactics and the process stem from this fundamental uh, sometimes difference we have about whether actions produce trust or whether a relationship can produce trust that can then produce actions. And I think that we often see that differently in the international community, even among our partners, never mind among um, the people we're trying to sit across the table from. But I do think that uh, there's a fundamental tension in, in going forward between, and it comes from our long experience, with North Korea, um, we want to agree on what the top priority is so that we can start this process of you know, getting actions and verification, et cetera, and build that trust that we need to, to get further down the road. At the same time, we understand and know from dealing with the North Koreans that if you haven't mentioned something at the very beginning, um, you know, when you try to bring it up later, it is going to have a detrimental impact on everything that you've done up to that point. So it's very hard for people to sit here and say, we need to focus on denuclearization. And I agree with everyone, everyone's comment that we still don't know exactly what denuclearization is. What are we talking about? So we haven't even gotten agreement on that yet. Um, but I think we do have agreement that that is the first uh, and most urgent and top priority, not least because um, we have grounds in the international system on which to go after that program, which will come up in the negotiation <coughs> with North Korea with regards to its missile programs, space launch programs, and other things, and, and question of rights and sovereignty, et cetera, and those will all come up. But 
but having a priority, um, having all of the partners and allies agree that that's the priority and still have North Korea understand that there are other things we're going to be concerned about that we're going to want to address in the course of discussions along the way. I mean, this is kind of fundamental, and I think that the first really important thing we need to do is get with our closest allies and make sure that no matter what the tactics are that we're pursuing, we all agree that denuclearization, and we should have a better sense of what we mean by that specifically, um, is what we're all agreed we're going after in the first sort of set of interactions. Great. No, that's, that's a good point about making sure at least everything is on the table, and Ambassador <laughs> Tsai alludes to it with the, the dynamic with the negotiations with Iran. And it, 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 uh, you know, it, it makes me think that if I understand that, that impulse, but if, if we lay out all of those things, um, it's a pretty big list um, in terms of denuclearization, WMD, missiles, uh, abductee issue, and, and really the issue of human rights is still there. Um, so how, how do we lay this out in a way that's not, you know, almost immediately kind of shuts down the, 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 the response or the interaction with, with the North Koreans um, I mean, I guess to some extent we do that by in terms of what we're offering in exchange for it, but uh, I don't know. It seems right now we have relatively vague promises of a beautiful promise, a beautiful future for North Korea if they agree to this whole long list of specific things that, that we're demanding. Um, Suzanne or Chung Min, do you have any thoughts? I mean, you've been following these negotiations and interactions for Go some ahead, time. Go ahead, Suzanne. Okay. Let me jump in, and I've been unshackled my whole career, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to continue fulfilling that tradition, if you don't mind. So I think we need to step back and think about uh, what the North Korean mindset is going into this. And it reminds me of a visit I had to Pyongyang um, in February 2017 to meet with officials there. This was just a few weeks after President Trump's inauguration. And the key question that kept coming up is, is this indeed an opportunity to think about the relationship in a different way? Can we think anew? And the North Koreans were very taken with this approach. Uh, this was something that they wanted to talk about extensively. Um, could this be a fresh start? They certainly liked what they heard from President Trump as a candidate when he said, yes, he'd be willing to sit down with Kim Jong-un and have a hamburger and begin engagement without preconditions. So that was a big win. Um, but there's been a lot of water under the bridge, to put it mildly, and um, very hard feelings on both sides, um, a deep sense of mistrust uh, that we can't escape. Uh, but on the plus side, unlike Iran, when Trump came in on, with Iran, there was no agreement there that saddled the relationship. Uh, there was no agreement in place that the president uh, wanted to undo. So in a lot of ways, it was an opportunity for a fresh start. And in February, when I was in Pyongyang, I was quite surprised when the North Koreans brought up the idea of a presidential summit. And uh, my reaction was, well, it's much too soon for that. <laughs> we really need to have some concrete deliverables before we could even talk. So that proves, what do I know? So now uh, we did have this summit in all its pageantry in, in um, June. <clears throat> but here we are four months later, and the fact is we really have not made much progress. I'm struck by um, uh, General Ayer's presentation this morning. Uh, all that the UN command is doing uh, is quite impressive. But the reality is the US, North Korea, bilateral part, uh, is at an impasse, and I think we have to face up to that. Um, I would contend uh, that we really have to get back to the basics. We are really in a pre-negotiation phase. We are not even in the negotiation phase with the North Koreans. The fundamentals aren't even in place. We haven't had discussions of what are the objectives that we share, what the definitions of the various concepts, um, uh, what are the red lines that each side sees? Is there a win-win that's possible at the end of that? And when I think about the Iran negotiations, 
uh, months were spent on these very questions and secret talks before they even got to the negotiating table to get these things ironed out. And we're not there yet. So we've hit an impasse. And I think what appealed to North Korea was the promise of this new kind of relationship. And it's no con coincidence that this is how the, the document that came out of Singapore summit, uh, starts. Uh, and I agree with that approach. I think this is exactly the way we should be approaching North Korea. Um, but the fact is, we don't have a diplomatic process in place. And my hope for uh, Secretary Pompeo's trip to Pyongyang, it's a very important time, I would really like to see him go in there and lay out the vision for how do we get to a peace regime. Step by step, what are the, um, everything from the declaration of the end of the war to getting to a path for normalization, security guarantees, uh, how we tackle sanctions. And let's try to seize the North Koreans' minds around these issues and, of course, put it in the context of action for action. Um, the problem we're facing is that uh, in the discussions in Singapore, the North Koreans liked very much what they heard from President Trump. There was a private meeting between him and Kim Jong-un by a lot of accounts. There were no officials in the room, unfortunately, to, to corroborate this. But by the North Koreans' accounts, President Trump did agree to a end of war declaration. And then we've had President Moon come forward and say he'd like to get that done um, by the end of the year. So I think this is the approach we need to take with the North Koreans. They're not going to budge until they get that end of war declaration. I think we have to face that. In the meantime, we have leverage that we need to use, and we're only going to get there if we have a serious diplomatic initiative in place to do that. Yeah. OK, thanks. That, so you mentioned a, a bunch of things that begin to come on the other side of the ledger, the issue of sanctions, the issue of security guarantees, peace regime, uh, economic development, end of war declaration. So, so we're building uh, maybe something to help counteract various things we're, um, we're, we're, we're looking to get. Uh, from North Korea. Chung Min, what, what do you think about some of these things you've heard? You know, uh, Jim introduced me as being on the left, very far left. <laughs> and that doesn't really uh, drive with my political views, nor am I on the far end of the, uh, of the spectrum either. If you look at President Moon's strategy over the last oh, eight, nine months, everything that he has wanted has come to fruition. And it begins with his Berlin speech, and then the Olympic thaw, Kim Yo-jong coming to the opening ceremonies, and she stole the show, as you all know. And throughout the two summits in April and May, and now in Pyongyang in September, and if Kim Jong-un comes to Seoul for the first time, sometime in the fall, by the end of the year, I guarantee you that there will be a media frenzy uh, that has no parallel. And so I go back to the so-called pre-Gorby days, when Mikhail Gorbachev, was elected as the Secretary General in March 1985, there was a lot of skepticism in Washington whether this guy was for real. And it took two, three years before people began to believe that perestroika and glasnost was, was actually happening on the ground. What I see happening now is that optically, Kim Jong-un is trying to act like Gorbachev. But substantively, he is not. And I think the political mood in Korea is being driven so harshly, and so it's accelerating at a pace that nobody can control, that the whole word peace regime encapsulates everything. But if you really go deeply into the bowels of what that means, there are still outstanding issues that will never be resolved, either this year or by next year. And I'm talking about whether it's biochemical weapons, whether it's about North Korea Special Operations Forces on the military side, uh, the long-range artillery based along the DMZ. But if you look at the political and humanitarian issues, not a single word has been spoken by the government, the Korean government, on, this, on the plight of human rights in North Korea. Our foreign minister said just a few days ago that she is not going to bring this up, and understandably for politically sensitive issues. But not a single word on the future of the North Korean people was included in the two declarations. And for me as a Korean, the end state that I, I, I envision 
although I have no say in this, is to have a unified Korea that is free, that is democratic, and enjoys universal values. And, you know, for a South Korean president who has been a stand bearer of democracy and for human rights throughout his adult life, I think it is very important for a Korean president to say that over the longer term, however this evolves, I hope to see a unified Korea that really is free. And of course, Kim Jong-un is never going to accept this. So that's the big issue that we have to circle. And I just don't know how we're going to get there from here. So all these technical issues are important, but the political uh, 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 speedometer is growing at like 180 miles per hour. But at some point, that's going to be blocked by real political uh, walls that we have to overcome. No, thank you. Uh, uh, hearing all these different comments really makes me think, on the one hand, optimistically, that this, this idea of having everything out on the table, even if it's a longer time horizon, um, having some vague understanding about a, a long distance goal or objective mutually, and I mean this with North Korea and, and us and among the allies, gives us a chance to, I think, bridge some of the gaps that exist between Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo on what's the, the right near-term strategy, what should we do next month. Or, so in, in a way, I'm optimistic that, that is, that's, a, that's helpful in a possible uh, method of, of managing the situation, unless it contains elements that are so fundamentally uh, uh, distasteful or, or non-starters from a North Korean point of view that, that, that they wouldn't even enter into that. So I, I mean, we have to manage um, that process, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested by that. Jim, could I just add one, sure. one small point? <clears throat> you know, people talk about East and West Germany as a historical model for the two Koreas. And there are similarities. But the biggest difference is German unification occurred at the nadir of Soviet power. The Moscow was on its knees. Korean unification, whenever it comes, and what, in whatever form or shape, will come at the apex of Chinese power. And how you actually deal with this from an, an American, uh, Japanese, and multilateral perspective, I would argue, is something that none of us have really spent much time on. And unless you get the Chinese on board, none of this is really going to happen. And they're going to have a much larger footprint, um, whether we like it or not, on these issues. Yeah. And I, and I do want to come back to China, because we haven't talked about it, it much. Um, and it's, it's interesting in the context of how you look at Vice President Pence's speech yesterday and how challenging or competitive now the US-China yeah. relationship is in this regard. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Prime Minister Abe is scheduled to go to uh, Beijing later this, uh, this, this month, and, and we have some potential uh, warming there. So maybe there's, there's some balance. But before I get to, to China, I want to focus more specifically on this end of war declaration issue um, as, as potentially something uh, that we might offer to North Korea, even though they say it's not necessarily a bargaining chip. Um, from Japan's perspective and Washington's perspective, uh, how, how big of a deal is this? Um, the, the South Korean side has tried to emphasize it's a political statement. It doesn't necessarily undermine the legitimacy of UN command and other presence of US forces, et cetera. Um, but is that the view from Tokyo? Does Tokyo see an end of war declaration as, as potentially a slippery slope or dangerous? Or is it something that would be uh, a good a uh, step towards building peace on the peninsula? What's well, I, uh, again, uh, I have to say I'm not representing uh, right. the government. Right. <laughs> but still, uh, you know, I could say this one. Uh, you know, these uh, declarations of ending the war is uh, pretty much symbolic, to be honest. I mean, if you look at the current status, I mean, uh, the ceasefire, no war, no fighting. And so it's basically to confirm the status quo in a way, and also showing some uh, peaceful intent, if there is any. So for that reason, I, it doesn't uh, much affect actual things on the ground. But what is uh, worrying a bit uh, to Tokyo is that uh, all this uh, political mood 
that uh, we are getting into new phase, which is fantastic, you know, for the recovering the relationship without having the real things mm. shaping up on the process of denuclearization. And the people think it's great. We are ending the war. It's a now new area. We could celebrate without getting into the heart of the matter. That is a danger. And if this declaration of ending the war is, is simply the political uh, expressions of the things and doesn't have anything tangible uh, showing the seriousness on the part of North Korea to go for denuclearization, this is, could be ending up simply the political show. And that is worrisome. And so I'm not against uh, mm -hmm. this uh, declaration for ending the war itself if that is accompanied by serious specific commitment of the actions on the part of North Korea for denuclearization, not simply confirming a goodwill or honest will or just a beyond beyond the commitment without telling what's in there. So these are the real issues, but we wanna see that one. If that will come out, that'd be great. Right. I, can I agree profusely with the ambassador? Sure. I think it's largely symbolic too. It's also quite psychological from the point of view of the North Koreans. And I do think that it, if it is embedded in a long-term strategy that gets to the other priorities that we have, uh, then that's a point of leverage we should be using and maximizing. Um, the other thing is, uh, from a U.S. point of view, I think there's some worry here in Washington uh, that'll have implications for our forces on the peninsula, uh, legal implications. But again, I see it as largely symbolic that those issues would be tackled down the line when we get to, hopefully, a peace agreement. The other thing we have to keep in mind is um, there is a very real uh, process of reconciliation happening between North and South Korea now. And we should be doing all we can to support that process. It's in our interest that uh, they're pursuing reconciliation. And I do think uh, a declaration uh, end of war would help that process uh, move forward as well. I'd like to also profusely agree with the ambassador. I think <laughs> um, I heard a story recently about back in the agreed framework days, you know, our negotiator was sent to get the North Koreans to give up their nuclear program. And, and so, you know, he asked, well, what is it that I'm going to offer? And um, the, the response was, well, you can tell the North Koreans they'll be part of the Asian economic miracle. Um, and um, we ended up with two light water reactors and, and keto and everything else. But uh, so that tells you something about what kind of leverage we have on our side and what kind of compelling leverage um, that you're going to end up needing in a negotiation. So, you know, for negotiators' dream is to look for something like this that's mainly, um, you know, not giving up any of the sort of real nuts and bolts substantive things that you're going to want to get to in the, in the negotiation, but something that sets a, a good frame for a hopefully successful negotiation. Um, when I think about this end of war declaration, the, the Koreans, the South Korean government, um, President Moon very much wants to see this go forward, and I think we also need to do what we can. Yeah. yeah. You know, Jim, if you look at the Pyongyang Declaration, it says it is basically an end to hostilities and to make the Korean Peninsula into a peace zone. So the two leaders, Moon and Kim, have already said, as far as I'm concerned, a de facto end of war statement. Problem is, will they come out with the U.S. and sit down and say, "This is, we are formally announcing the end of the Korean War, leading towards a peace treaty." I agree with all the speakers before me. Rapprochement is good. Nobody's against South North Detente, but you have to ask yourself, what is really? Well, how do we define real inter-Korean detente? And it is: Will the borders be open? Will North Koreans be able to watch free TV? Will they be able to make phone calls to their relatives in the South? Will there be unfettered exchange of views? And, and the answer is no. And so the, the government is driving rapprochement and detente, which is great at the highest political levels, but it is not you know, filtering down into the everyday life of North Koreans. 
that to me is much more important than leaders saying the war is over, let's go ahead uh, with issues X, Y, and Z. Yeah, well that gets to this issue of substance versus uh, symbolism that, uh, that, that is a theme coming out of this. Um, I mean, my view is end of war declaration has some potential utility, but it needs to be a two-way street. And I think what we need to get from North Korea in this context is something substantive in the context of, of peace building. Now, whether that's a declaration of their nuclear program or whether that's uh, moving troops back uh, farther away from the D DMZ, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I think it could be the opening bid of a process going forward. Uh, the North Koreans want it badly, so it does give us leverage. Uh, one thing uh, we can think about are what are some initial corresponding measures that we could put on the table and ask the North Koreans to move forward. They've already put one on the table, de dismantling Yong Yongbyon. Mm -hmm. Now, some critics have said, well, um, that's not uh, a big give, but as Sig Hecker put it, Yongbyon is old, but it certainly is operational. That's how I felt when I woke up at 3.30 this morning to come here. Old, but operational. <laughs> um, so okay. I We're think, not talking decommissioning here, though. <laughs> so I think it's a starting point that you should take that. The other thing, I think it was discussed in the earlier panel, we have now a, um, a cessation of testing, both nuclear and um, missiles that has been ongoing. Let's verify it. Let's codify it. I think that would could be an early win. It's not difficult to uh, to verify, but is that a way to get inspectors back in on the ground at an early stage? What if the so these oh, are the sorry. things I think we should be thinking about as a you know the North Koreans say, they themselves say it has to be a corresponding. The question is, um, can we find a way to jump off the diving board together? <laughs> Uh, are diplomats creative enough to be able to think of ways where we can take the first step simultaneously? Yeah. Um, maybe we, could, we can make a big production out of it that would appeal to President Trump, have a giant clock. They do something at the exact moment we do. I mean, let's, I think we just need to get this done. Well, the, the mention of missiles and or testing uh, moratorium makes me jump ahead to a different question, but I'll come back to something else I wanted to mentioned before, wouldn't the inclination be then, because we're, we're in a, a unspoken freeze-freeze situation, perhaps, where we have frozen major US rock exercise, military exercises and they have frozen, suspended uh, nuclear missile testing. If we want to codify it, what do we, how do we respond if they come back and say, well, sure, we'll stop this if you stop that. So a part of this process is also us drawing certain lines at which we won't compromise further. And is, is that one of those lines? Because I think from a US-Japan alliance perspective and from a us rock alliance perspective, the readiness issue, the deterrence factor, there, somewhere there's a line where you're not willing to, to give. And I, I wonder if we should address that a little bit. You know, Jim, when okay. they had, Sorry, excuse me, it's Ambassador, um, when North Korea is talking about a number of issues, the fact that in 1998, India and Pakistan had a number of nuclear tests, and since then they've not had any nuclear tests, but the number of warheads, especially in Pakistan, have continued to increase. And so there is no more need for North Korea to conduct tests. I don't think that's a real natural give. But I, I agree with you, the moment the US and the ROK begins you know, these major exercises, uh, that will be a problem because politically the North Koreans will say, you are now going backwards on your earlier commitments. The second, I, I think a very important factor here is the type of message that President Trump sends to his allies, as well as to North Korea. Uh, he mentioned this beautiful letter that he got from Kim Jong-un. Uh, I, I hope he makes it public so that we can see how beautiful it is. Um, but seriously, it's very important for the president to assure his allies while also taking the North Koreans and saying, I will deal with you under these conditions. But, you know, he has to really assure the Japanese and the Koreans that we are actually talking from the same sheet of music. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, some uh, skepticism about this wisdom 
of words versus words, action versus action, step by step. This is kind of deja vu. <laughs> we tried this before, and we were stuck because there are too many stages mm. of uh, from one stage to another. When we go to the stage where we expect the declarations and the verification issues, people were now argue in the previous sessions. There is a suddenly uh, other elements coming in. If we don't do that, we don't do it. Uh, they don't declare for the nuclear weapons. It's something else. We would declare Myeongbyong facilities, but to get this done or even to move, you need to give uh, remaining portion, part of uh, energy assistance. You know, all this come in uh, but step by step versus, you know, action versus action. Then uh, what would you do if after this declaration of ending the war, North Korea want to see the, uh, all these uh, declarations of ending uh, joint exercise, say? Then uh, if that is done, well, we give some Myeongbyong facility and so forth without committing anything about nuclear weapon, then you might, uh, they might ask you, well, can you think about uh, with reducing U.S. forces? That's a pretty uh, headache to us. We are, uh, you know, reducing uh, the threat mutually. We are going to, you know, decrease the nuclear weapons, whatever. You guys have to do the same stuff to us. So, in that way, what is the measurement of uh, equivalency of the step to be taken? And I'm not quite sure about there is all this, uh, you know, quality of the action to be taken by each other. So in that way, they will continue to play nuclear cards throughout the process. They never give up the nuclear weapons. And Myeongbyong facility is a good step, of course. But you keep all those nuclear weapons and other facilities intact, not to mention the missile. Then they, they would argue that they, you, you need to do all the things before they would complete the action. Then we are stuck. That's my concern. Well, let me approach this a different way then um, with a specific example. The sanctions are a form of leverage that we have. Um, that is the potential removal of them. Um, and we, uh, you know, one way of, 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 of using them, uh, well, there's two, two issues. One issue is that leverage depends heavily on their successful enforcement. So sanctions are more valuable to us if they are being well enforced because the desire then by North Korea to have them uh, be alleviated in some way is, is greater. So personally, that's why I think the sanctions enforcement piece is particularly important. And so there, there's another alliance issue in the terms of making sure we're all stressing strict enforcement of sanctions and hopefully we can get uh, sold to see it in the same way that Washington and Tokyo sees it. Uh, but we also have to, I think, demonstrate to Seoul that we're willing to be flexible on sanctions when that moment arises. So my specific example is this. What if we were to propose not necessarily removing sanctions early in the process, but certain types of exemptions, um, and specifically targeted at inter-Korean relations? So there, there, there is a pent-up uh, energy in, in South Korea, as you described, chung Men, to get going on roads and rails and, and various projects. What if you opened up, relieved some of that pressure with a special exemption and a couple of key special economic zones that inter-Korean projects could go forward? Would that be a useful tool early in the process to help get some of these more substantive uh, 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 steps by, by North Korea? And what would we want to see in return for that? Well, you know, so far under the, although the detailed uh, blueprint has not yet been made public, what has been made public so far on, based on the agreements in, in made in Pyongyang is that South Korea is interested in investing over $100 billion in improving North Korea's infrastructure, especially roads, ports, and railways. And they want to do that, and as you recall, four of the top CEOs of South Korea's largest conglomerates visited uh, Pyongyang at the same time. 
but the businesses will not commit major investments until, as you correctly pointed out, the UN sanctions issue is basically either resolved or they make a U-turn or something really happens. What I worry about is that as that happens, Jim, the political will to continue to maintain so-called maximum pressure uh, by, by the UN Security Council would become weakened. And I, see, I already see, see, see that happening. So if you give the Koreans even more leeway, which is good for inter-Korean cooperation, but the ability of the sanctions to really apply pressure on Pyongyang will become, in my opinion, much weaker. And just last week uh, in New York at UNGA, we did hear both the Russians and Chinese say, yeah. it's time to loosen the That's sanctions. Right. Yeah. So they're yeah. already, so maximum pressure, I think we should come to uh, realize is dead. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not what it was. I don't think we can capture it unless the North Koreans do something really provocative, really right. stupid. Uh, so I think we, we fall into this trap of looking at sanctions as if they're the ends. But they're really to, the means to get to a change in behavior. And unless you're willing to release the valve at appropriate times in exchange for corresponding actions, then we're missing the point of what sanctions are meant to be. They're not meant to be punitive in a pure sense. They're meant to influence behavior. So I would, um, I think I, I like the way you put it, Jim, the, how you laid it out. Uh, I think that's something that should be thought about seriously. I would also yeah. like okay, to say, ahead. I mean, I think the, one of the problems was identified by the ambassador, which is the things that we have to give that North Korea wants, we're going to have to give early. And the, the, the big things we have to do early and the big things the North Koreans are going to have to do come late in this process. And by the way, this is going to be a very long process. We haven't talked to North Korea for now years. We're starting to talk to them again. We have a new leader. We have a lot to learn about what this process is going to look like. It's going to take a long time to hash out all these details. If there are steps in corresponding steps, these are things that are going to talk, we're going to talk to the North Koreans about for a very long time. So I'm very happy to see that the administration have gone away from its, this needs to be done in three months to, you know, now we've got more time. This is going to take more time because that's absolutely the case. I mean, I, I do think that what the North Koreans are masters at is splitting the international community. I mean, they, they have a very weak hand that they play, and they play it very well. And it's been too easy for them to divide the international community. And if we are not very, very well coordinated, if we do not have a completely united front, we saw this with the glo maximum global pressure campaign. We managed to get that, maybe for the first time that, you know, frankly, I can remember on North Korea, we had uh, this unified front and in the face of very bad North Korean behavior and that's what it took to get that and I think Suzanne is right basically maximum pressure is dead because not just China and Russia but you know other countries I mean we've been getting high level North Korean delegations we have the warming between North mm -hmm. and South I mean it's just a different feeling out there and and so our leverage is diminishing almost by the day I hate to tell you and so it's going to it. be a very hard negotiation. <laughs> this is very hard stuff <clears throat> to do. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm so reluctant to try to give up on, on the uh, pressure piece. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I, uh, I, I disagree on point, on one point is that uh, this maximum pressure is not dead yet. Although, uh, you know, seemingly there is some uh, some loosening on the part on the part of on the part of China and Russia, uh, they, they are sneaking around. We all know it. There is a UN sanctions uh, committee. I mean, talking about how uh, there are some uh, violations of the things, and the uh, South Korean government is now working on the some of the project with some condition, but all those projects are done. You have to change the uh, Security Council uh, uh, resolutions. Uh, and because all these things uh, are exceptions, even if you say exception, these are not exceptions anymore. These are the major current of assisting North Korea economically and, and other terms. So even if we maintain the sanction, uh, these sanctions are becoming uh, thinner and very nominal. And people believe that this is a uh, already a political one, 
and knowing that the, all these sanctions are becoming, uh, uh, you know, less edgy of the thought. But still, I don't say that, that the, the maximum pressure is dead because I think I, as we move on, if there is a stuck in the, uh, this negotiation, I don't say that it will be stuck, but if there is always a possibility, then we have to come back to, again, the maximum pressure. So we need to maintain the basic uh, you know, uh, structure of uh, getting other countries together around us, put, continue to put up pressure unless we get the real denuclearized process. Mm -hmm. And let me clarify, I'm sure. not advocating that we lift all the sanctions right. in one fell swoop. I like the idea of exemptions. If that can be done through the UN Security Council, I think we should try it on a project by project basis. But I think there's an 800 pound elephant in the room and that is our own president. That is also, um, I think uh, his actions have helped put the nail in the coffin of maximum pressure. For example, when he says North Korea is no longer a nuclear threat, um, you know, that undercuts our d diplomats. When he says uh, we're not in a hurry, we're, what's the rush? We have time to do this. If I'm a U.S. diplomat going to the table with the North Koreans, you know, that's, you're killing me. You're cutting off my legs uh, in order to get uh, things done. So I think, um, you know, in some ways our own president has, um, you know, diminished the maximum pressure we were exerting. Uh, and this is a bigger issue that I think we have to address is how to um, get the president to step back, uh, stop tweeting, uh, be quiet, send in the diplomats, <laughs> let them do their work. Uh, we have a special envoy for North Korea now. Uh, we need uh, we need to ramp up, um, certainly, the uh, key people working on these issues. As Susan said, this is going to be a very intense negotiation. It will be probably several, multiple negotiations happening simultaneously. We need to beef up our, our um, bench in order to do that. And, uh, you know, the, the question is, can we imagine our president doing this? stepping back. Maybe we'll say you can continue the love letters while this all goes on, but I'm not asking rhetorically. A show of hands, how many people think the president is capable of this? Okay, one. <laughs> so this is a real issue I think we have to face as we move forward is, uh, is um, you know, stop undercutting our diplomats. This is really hard work. Let them get in there and do the work that needs to be done with the full support of the U.S. government, the military to back them up when if, if we ever get, need that. Um, it worries me. Well, that, and that presumes you have a willing partner on the other side who's willing to engage with you in that level of, of depth of, of discussion. There's two quick issues I, I still want to get to before I open it up to the audience, and one relates to this issue of process. Um, and, I'm, and, and Susan, you're welcome to comment whether or not you think the president is undercutting the diplomatic corps uh, mm -hmm. or not. But I'm, I'm thinking more broadly about um, now the six party talks was an experience that we had that uh, had some success, but obviously didn't accomplish what it uh, was meant to. And nobody seems to want to go back to the six party process. But what else can we do to really pull together a multilateral uh, 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 co coordination, collaboration, cooperation. So we had the TCOG in the past, the Trilateral Coordination Oversight Group, which was a US, Japan, South Korea means of coordinating policy. We had the six party process, et cetera, at another moment in time. Um, I'm thinking we should be launching now. Uh, uh, how do we bring China into this process of talking about verification. Even if we don't have an agreement yet, we can talk about how would we fund it? How would we staff it? What's the role of the IAEA? We don't have to make decisions necessarily, but we, we have all this shuttle diplomacy going on that seems you have to get to a, a, a broader multilateral process. And um, I'm wondering, if, is, is it too soon for that? Or, or how do we stimulate I would say that? it's too late. Ooh, uh, too late. No. Not too late that we shouldn't do it. We should have started this oh, a long yeah. time yeah, yeah. ago. And it's interesting when I think of my discussions with the North Koreans, um, you know, for a very long time, they were only interested in talking to the United States. 
Uh, they were not interested in talking to South Korea. They were not interested in talking to China. They just wanted to have direct dialogue with the U.S. And then something changed uh, around this time last year. Uh, I think it was the personal insult by the president, his speech at UNGA, uh, and they turned their attention to Moon, President Moon. And he offered a, a diplomatic off-ramp with the Olympics and thankfully um, led that process to where we're today, where the reduction, where the tensions have been reduced dramatically. But I think, um, so there are two, just to um, follow up my previous comment, there are two challenges I think we face, how to conduct the bilateral diplomacy effectively and how to conduct the multilateral uh, level of diplomacy effectively. And I think right now we're doing both very poorly. You know, Jim, the quick answer is NAFTA is now called the uh, USMCA, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Right. So just change the six party talks to whatever fits, you know, uh, the, the, the <laughs> menu of the week. But in a more serious vein, I agree absolutely with you that it is crucial to get the Chinese and the Russians on board. Because since they have veto power in the UN, anything that, that gets to the final stage of a peace deal or whatever, you have to get those two powers involved. And the other thing is US, you know, uh, Korea, Japan, trilateral cooperation. And I think that is being discussed and Seoul gives support for that. But I believe that South Korea has to be much more forceful in enhancing trilateral security cooperation. Because if these three critical allies do not understand topics that are critical to Korean security, I guarantee you that once the negotiations start down the path, there will be, I would argue, differences of opinion between Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington. I can jump in. I mean, I think um, my comments about the maximum global pressure campaign being the first time I've ever seen that level of unity in the international community and the impact that it had on getting us to where we are is, is sort of a, a platform from which we can leap off into Oh, now where are we and what has happened to that kind of international unified front vis-a-vis -vis North Korea? And it's exactly your question, what are we doing to try to preserve that unity? And the answer is we're not doing much. And I think that's extremely unfortunate. We should have started a long time ago. I don't understand the aversion to the six-party you know, format. I don't understand the aversion, frankly, to multilateralism. And I think and we will not get anywhere in this negotiation because, like I said, Kim Jong Un and the North Koreans, and we've already seen it, is they're just masters at playing us mm. off each other, and they will exploit it in a negotiation. We have seen it. We aren't even really lined up with our allies on the prioritization of what it is we want to get out of this negotiation, and they will exploit that first, and they will continue to exploit other differences with China, Russia, and Europe and other countries that are going to end up being involved in this negotiation have always been involved in these negotiations, have things to bring to bear in the negotiation. And um, I really just think it um, is not wise for us to be thinking we can go on our own track and leave our partners and other people that have a very large interest in security and aside. So. I think right. they're also masters at splitting our own government. I mean, you know, what the North Koreans are telling people is uh, President Trump agreed to this end of war declaration. It's Bolton and Pompeo who are not allowing him to move forward. And one of my concerns is um, it seems like they're only interested in summit diplomacy now, leader to le leader, with very little getting done in mm. between. And uh, I'm worried that they may no longer see Pompeo as a viable interlocutor. And what does that mean for Steve Began, who's just star who hasn't yeah. even met the North Korean? Well, and the, so that worries me. So I agree with Susan. They are masterful in seeing a weakness and honing in on that and exploiting it. And I think they've done that with this with this administration. Yeah, yeah. And the splits in our administration have probably inhibited our ability to really play this this role, Ambassador. Yeah, I think the uh, the good part about this uh, U.S. Uh, North Korea talks is that uh, it has been always a desire of North Korea uh, to be recognized as an equal partner to negotiate, and this summit talks is giving that. So that doesn't mean 
that uh, they would not exploit the process. That's what's uh, now happening now. And, uh, but it's easy to say that uh, North Korea is exploiting and uh, we are not doing good enough. Possibly that could be the case, but still, I think we need to work this out. My point is that uh, this denuclearization negotiations is, in essence, uh, always U.S.-North Korean talk. Even during uh, all this uh, four-party talk, three-party talk, or six-party talk, the essential part of the negotiation is bilateral, U.S. and North Korea. We all know it. But the function, the role of the others, especially the friends and allies of the United States, is to, uh, to be together with the United States and give a good advice and register its own concern and move together. I think that's why it is important for us to, to have uh, U.S., Japan, and, and ROK uh, together. I think that's what uh, uh, you know, Secretary Pompeo is trying now. He's uh, stopping by and, and talking in, in, in before and after. And uh, I think that process is very important. I don't have any sort of uh, you know, uh, uh, doubt about the sincerity of the United States to, uh, to pay a full respect uh, to the opinions of friends and allies. I think he, he's exactly doing that uh, together with his uh, you know, uh, Secretary of State and all the others, and the you know, National Security Council. Well, we are doing pretty good conversations all the way. The issue is possibly that uh, uh, how more of the tactical dimension, if there is any yeah. sort of a subtle difference uh, of the approach. And, and when it comes to the uh, usefulness of the Chinese role and Russians, uh, I, I agree. I can't agree with it more. But Chinese position at this moment is that uh, uh, possibly uh, they are uh, not concerned as they used to be before because they have regained the relationship with North Korea. And North Korea has also regained the relationship with, uh, uh, with China. I think their priority for the moment is to strengthen this relationship rather than uh, uh, China pushing uh, North Korea to come forward uh, on, the, uh, on the negotiations. And, and also China has a big problem with the United States on the same front. So I think there is a reason for China to wait for the United States to seek the Chinese support on the issues. So you, you have to carefully design the timing of working together with countries like China. And uh, my personal view is that uh, when the negotiation is stuck, I think there is a big role for, for a country like China to play. When the negotiation is moving forward nicely, again, China, we need China because in order to wrap up the process, Without Chinese involvement, especially on the peace and security issue, it's very difficult. Yeah. So uh, we are knowing it, but for the moment, I think uh, U.S. Uh, uh, North Korean track is essential. We need to get this going. Yeah. No. Uh, so my last quick question before we open it up is related to this point. We've faced various little setbacks here and there, canceled summits, back on. Um, we're striving towards success, but <laughs> Should we prepare or how do we prepare for potential major setbacks constructively? In other words, how do we prepare for failure of this process? I don't want to say complete failure, but maybe we have some breakthroughs out of this process and we move on to Yonbyon and we start moving some inter-Korean projects. But what if we have a major setback? How do we prepare for that as, as an alliance and, and diplomatically, so in a constructive way? I think we should count on uh, the fact that there will be major setbacks, given the level of mistrust, what's at stake, uh, the fact that we have not been engaging with the North Koreans on a regular basis. So I think we should expect that. That's what happens when you engage an adversary where there's uh, a lot of different point of view. Uh, but we should be prepared to deal with it. One thing I think is the communications channels uh, need to be strengthened and improved. Um, I like the idea of uh, liaison offices. Uh, if we actually had a presence, a diplomatic presence in Pyongyang, I think that would be a big plus, and a diplomatic presence here, reciprocal in Washington, uh, that would be a key channel for um, communication. So when these points of disagreement um, happen, 
uh, when we have a setback, those channels don't break down. Uh, and there's, we're committed to it. Uh, so I think having a presence on the ground would help. That's just one idea. Definitely going to be setbacks, and this again feeds into this need. Dan talked about communications as a uh, constant communication with the other partners in the maximum global pressure campaign. If you need to turn to a space where you need to really ramp up leverage because there's a setback and you need to find a way to push, uh, you're going to need those partners. The U.S. Uh, is the lead negotiator, I agree, on denuclearization, but we don't have a lot of leverage or trade with or other things to give. And it's our other partners that have those things, and it's also the other partners that can withhold that kind of recognition and other things that North Korea wants. If we haven't brought the partners along and how the negotiation is unfolding in order to be able to show them that it's North Korea that's at, sort of the, at fault in this setback that we've encountered or that it's something that they're failing to do as opposed to the North Korean version, which will be that it's the U.S. that has failed to do it. We can't make the case to our partners because we've been convincing them and, and telling them all along what we're doing. Um, that will be a, a very hard uh, case to make, I think, at that point. And, and it's too late at that point to come to them and tell them, oh, this is what's been happening. You know, Jim, I think it's very important for President Moon and the Korean government to set very realistic expectations. Right now, it's basically on cloud nine. And so they're basically saying that everything's going to work out according to the principles declared in Panmunjom and in Pyongyang. One way to, ex to prepare the Korean public for a more realistic view, should things walk backwards, is to have a bipartisan policy in North Korea, which I don't see happening now. And the main reason is because the conservatives basically don't have a voice. So it is very important for the ruling party to reach out to the opposition and it is critical for the opposition parties, uh, mostly conservative or centrist, to really say, okay, if we want to really make this work, it's got to be a hold of government effort. And unless that happens, expectations are soaring now, but when they come tumbling down, there will be huge political, I would argue, headwinds uh, against, uh, against the government. Professor Sasai, any final thoughts on preparing for failure? Uh... <laughs> Well, the diplomat, uh, you always think about it, but uh, <laughs> don't say that in public. I see, uh, okay. <laughs> but I'm not a diplomat anymore. Right. Yeah. But uh, I think, of, of course, we have to prepare for it. One way of doing it is we, we need to go back to square one and to again go for the uh, maximum <laughs> pressure campaign, including um, every option is on the table, including military, which I don't think that <coughs> North, North Korea and even ROK would appreciate it. If we would keep that in mind as a future option, we could let that work as a deterrence uh, for, for their wrongdoing in the future. Thanks. Well, I'd like to invite General Air to join us up here um, because some of the questions he may want to weigh in on, and I'd actually give him a, a, a quick option if you have any, what you've heard in this panel so far, if there's anything that motivates you to make a comment now, you're, you're welcome to before I... No, and thank you for that. It's been a fascinating discussion and highly educational for me. Um, the whole discussion on the uh, end of war declaration is of particular interest because it calls into, uh, into question the legitimacy of our own organization. And I mentioned what President Moon has, has said here a couple of weeks ago. Um, but you have to question why, uh, why North Korea is pushing so hard for that end of war declaration. The, uh, the optimist would say that he needs it for a domestic audience to declare victory so he can change his ways and have a new approach. The pessimist would say it's another way to split the Allies apart. As was uh, very uh, eloquently said, they are experts at uh, separating allies. Um, and it started right from the beginning of their, their regime. Uh, Kissinger's book on China has got a great article, or a great uh, chapter on trilateral diplomacy on uh, on, on separating China and the Soviet Union uh, to get support uh, for the 1950 invasion. Uh, my boss likes to use the analogy of uh, uh, an open hand where North Korea is in the middle and each of the five fingers represent the regional partners and they're experts at separating uh, those partners apart instead of keeping the fingers together. So what could an end of war uh, declaration mean? 
Well, even if there is no legal basis for it, emotionally, um, people would start to question the presence and, and continued existence of United Nations Command. And it's a slippery slope to then question the presence of U.S. forces on the, uh, on the peninsula. So it's uh, no answers for it, but it's something we are definitely looking at closely. Great. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'd like to open it up to the audience. Same uh, uh, process as before. We'll have a microphone. Let us know who you are and, and ask your question. I have a woman here. And then I'll come up here, and then I'll go in the back. Hi, I'm Soyeon Kim from Radio for Asia. Um, so this weekend, Pompeo is going to meet Kim Jong-un, who um, Trump fell in love with. And um, so uh, ahead of this visit, uh, South Korean Prime Minister Kang kyung hwa proposed that maybe at this time, uh, US is not going to demand for a full declaration from North Korea. Instead, maybe um, uh, US offers some corresponding measures um, in exchange for uh, Young Jun site dismemberment, and we all know that it's not the, the most ideal approach. But I'm just so wondering how um, the panels uh, see this approach as um, in order to proceed the negotiation between U.S. and North Korea. Thank you. Um, I open it up to anybody who would like to respond. I can't help but offer a quick analogy that I was going to mention earlier. If you're crossing a river. Um, Ideally, you want to plot out which rocks you're going to hop on and then which, where that next rock will take you uh, to go and eventually get yourself across the river. If we're following this approach right now without all the lead-in dialogue and negotiations that we have not had really to date, we're just hopping on a rock and then looking around for the next rock uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. But, um, but I, I welcome some additional uh, thoughts. I think this, uh, the Young Beyond uh, issue will, be, will feature prominently in Secretary Pompeo's talks in Pyongyang. I think when we look back just a little while ago to the summit between um, Kim Jong-un and President Moon, it was very important for that declaration to have something specific, concrete in it, that we could call towards denuclearization. And I think Young Beyond was it. Uh, this allowed uh, the U.S. to say um, we now can move forward with engagement, uh, and here we are. So I think it will be a um, prominent feature of the discussion, and I think that's a good thing. Um, and to Jim's point, it's only going to be a good thing if indeed it is put in the context of a process going forward. Uh, is this one of the early steps? Well, what's next? Those are the sorts of discussions we should be having with the North Koreans at this stage. And that's why I feel very strongly that we should be going into these talks with a very robust proposal for how to get to uh, uh, what they call a peace regime. Uh, what are the steps we see going forward? And what are the corresponding steps we see along the way? Um, I think that's really the only way the North Koreans are going to. Any other thoughts, or we'll jump here? Uh, thank you. Uh, Rita Chen from Central News Agency, Taiwan. Uh, my question is about China's influence. That we, we just seen the Vice President Pence deliver a very strong and um, president <laughs> statement towards China. Um, I think the real people will expect uh, the tension between U.S. and China will end anytime soon. I'm just wondering that under this momentum, will China still help to deal with the issue about North Korea? And especially for Susan, that you are on the first front, that how will it uh, influence the uh, cross-strait issue, uh, cross-strait relationship as well? And how will you suggest Taiwan to secure its own interest under this circumstance? Thank you. Well, I don't. I mean, I'd rather leave the cross-strait question for another another day because this is really a film about DPRK um, and the allies. But I think that obviously uh, we've already talked a little bit about China's involvement in the North Korea issue. Um, I think their cooperation was essential when we had the maximum global pressure campaign going. I think that we were. I personally was surprised by the level of 
going beyond the UN sanctions that we saw coming out of Beijing in many respects, um, both on the sort of crossing of economic um, goods, you know, to and from across the border, and also in other ways that they went sort of beyond the UN sanctions to help the maximum pressure campaign. And I would just note that the maximum pressure campaign involved a lot of things that went beyond the current UN sanctions, not just on the part of China, but on the part of other countries. So, so that's the part that I think I see has already fallen back, not that we should lift the UN sanctions, but that you know, we're not really in the same kind of mode that we were in during that campaign. Um, and uh, you know, to resurrect that kind of uh, focus and fervor would be difficult in the absence of some kind of major bad behavior on the part of North Korea, I, I would submit. so. Uh, but on the on the issue of China, I agree with what the ambassador said that I think China is quite satisfied with the way things are unfolding at the moment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North Korea issue. They see the reduction in tension, which is you know, something that is very much uh, that they wanted to see. Uh, they've reestablished their relationship with North Korea, which had been on kind of hiatus. Um, and they've actually really stepped up their engagement with North Korea and reasserted their influence there, I would say. Uh, so I think um, despite what may be uh, happening in the U.S.-China relationship, uh, and it, there is an indication that there's sharp deterioration underway, uh, they will uh, continue to treat, I mean, Korea, they have a major security interest in North Korea too. It's, it's on their border. and um, their number one priority has got to be to keep stability in that area and maintain their influence and level of control over the process. And I think basically those needs are now currently being met, and they are still interested in seeing the U.S. and North Korea continue to talk. So I wouldn't expect anything that's happened recently to interrupt that. Ambassador, um, you've yes. had a lot of experience with China, and we see Japan-China relations improving a little bit. Is this potentially uh, a way to contribute to to the North Korea issue as well? Uh, yes, I think so. But uh, coming back to your question on Vice President uh, statement, uh, very strong vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis China, uh, including uh, all these uh, trade issues. Uh, some of the concerns expressed there we share. Uh, it's not our uh, because uh, of overall the Chinese behavior per se, but uh, it's related to fundamental discourse uh, China has been taking over the opening of its market and uh, its, uh, uh, its trade policy. I think there are lots uh, China could do without pro proclaiming its status as a developing country. I think they need to get rid of all these uh, old-fashioned uh, you know, uh, way of uh, handling the border measures and also adjusting some of their own policy, including uh, intellectual property issues, government subsidies and so forth. And these w we share, I mean, some of the concern. And I think that if that is addressed and done properly, that'd be great. And not in terms of uh, U.S.-Chinese uh, relationship, but also for the sake of Chinese self, but it's great. and. Even after that one, I think there will be argument that China could be a market economy, but still, I think uh, it's a good thing for China. Now, uh, having said it, I think uh, when it comes to the dealing uh, over, over North Korean issues in that context, my opinion is that we shouldn't really mix up uh, some of the things uh, uh, you know, we face as a, as a, as a challenge uh, from China on the trade and front and uh, once you try to mix uh, this uh, dealing on the on North Korean issue with some other issues uh, we shouldn't be transactional I mean that would complicate the matter I think because the nature of the threat is different and the nature of the threat coming from North Korea is uh, is totally different from some of the concern we have over the rise of China or Chinese trade policy having said it I think uh, our relationship uh, with China has been strained uh, for the reason familiar to all of you. But I, I think uh, what is happening now is uh, to, to kind of normalize that relationship. Normalize means that we don't have any uh, exchange of leaders' visits. 
it's a it's a abnormal. So I think uh, it's a process of uh, normalizing all this political dialogue between the two countries. I hope that would help uh, to uh, continue to uh, get the support from China on the uh, on the North Korean issues. Because uh, as I said, it at the end or even before uh, you know uh, we get stuck, we need Chinese support and. Uh, and we should recognize, uh, you know, uh, legitimate Chinese interest in there. So uh, we can't really shun away uh, Chinese involvement. So we need to be proper. And that's why I think uh, our uh, improvement of the relationship with China would help. Great. I'm going to take two questions uh, back to back. Um, I have, well, let me go to the back here. I have two hands in the back, and we'll do those two, and then I'll come back up to the front. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Taisuke Miba from the Atlantic Council. I have a question to uh, uh, Professor Zhong uh, Lee. Uh, when we talk about uh, trade-off, uh, we think it uh, moves very in a positive direction. One ultimate uh, possible uh, trade-off could be a trade-off between the denuclearization and alliance. I mean that the U.S. Uh, are okay in the alliance, and uh, so. Uh, if you know, uh, you have to face this uh, trade-off, uh, you know, if, uh, for example, like DPRK comes up with a sort of a condition that they can come up with a total denuclearization in exchange with the withdrawal of uh, U.S. presence in South Korea and withdrawal of a U.S. nuclear umbrella provided to the South Korea, uh, would, it be, uh, would it be acceptable to you and the Moon Jae-in administration and South Korean people. Okay, think about that. Then we have one more here. <laughs> uh, Virginia Ferris with the Catholic Bishops Conference. So, Professor Lee, uh, I am interested. You made reference to the fact that the need for a to get the opposition on board with um, what President Moon is trying to do. So, my question is related to overall public opinion, how is public opinion viewing what President Moon is trying to do? Is he way far out? And related to that in terms of US or UN forces within Korea, what is public opinion now about the presence of those forces and how long they should stay? Let me just quickly take those two questions. Uh, both are very, very good. I think if you look at the opinion polls in South Korea over the last uh, seven, eight months, as the so-called you know, thaw has begun, the support for the US ROK alliance is about 80%. And support for sustained American forces presence in South Korea is about 75% or even higher. And that, I think, is indicative of the fact that the public supports both a reduction in tensions in South-North relations but they also understand you cannot trust North Korea 100%. So in that sense, for the vast majority of the Korean public, a strong US presence is a very important, I would argue, variable for sustaining Korean security. On, the, uh, on my colleague from the Atlantic Council, my personal, uh, it's not a choice. You want to have both denuclearization and a strong US ROK alliance. If I had to choose personally, I would choose the alliance. Because that, I think, is much more important because then we can deal with denuclearization by enhancing deterrence packages, making sure that extended deterrence by the US is stronger, et cetera. But if you, you simply cannot choose, but if I had to choose, I would choose the alliance. For President Moon, I don't speak on behalf of the Korean government. He has said publicly that denuclearization, South North uh, rapprochement, and the alliance are separate. So to date, he has said the right things. General Ayer, can I ask you, just related to this question about public support and, and the alliance, the UN command gets put in the uncomfortable position from time to time of having to approve or, or dis disapprove of certain proposals um, for inter-Korean exchanges and, and such. If this ramps up uh, significantly going forward, is that um, uh, something you have to, uh, uh, is, that, is that a potential problem or how, how is the command kind of approaching some of these challenges of more frequent 
back and forth uh, in Iraq? No, it's absolutely something that we are concerned about, especially if there's a divergence between South Korean and U.S. approach with UNC stuck in the middle. <laughs> it could become a convenient punching bag um, without directly, um, directly insulting uh, the U.S., if, if you will. Uh, so we're watching that one very, very carefully. But uh, in, in terms of public opinion, um, the, the, from what I have seen, uh, the people of Korea are extremely thankful uh, for UNC sending state contributions during uh, the Korean War. There is less awareness uh, about the current uh, commitments and uh, inter international commitments on, on the Korean Peninsula, uh, whereas most of the focus, rightly so, is on the bilateral ROC-US alliance. Um, and so it's just a lack of awareness, and thus our efforts to get out there and engage and educate. We have time for one more question. Uh, this gentleman had had his hand up from the very beginning, so my apologies you. to those um, that I couldn't get to. My name is uh, Roberto Anker. I just uh, I live in the West Coast. I have no association to any institution, so I am just personally in the public. Uh, my take, uh, very sim I apologize for my simplistic approach, but in the long term, I don't think that Kim Jong-un is afraid of the United States, South Korea, or Japan. He's only afraid of his own people. And he sees this whole process, in my opinion, as another way, another way of playing the clock in a different way and uh, holding his grip in power. And well, thank you. Um, you know, that. That, that gives me a quick opening, though, maybe to, to, to end this uh, in, and, and get your feedback on this topic. If Kim Jong-un goes to Seoul by the end of this year, that strikes me as a pretty dramatic event. And um, we've, there are kind of two narratives about what Kim Jong-un is, is up to. One is, is potentially just this is a strategy for holding on to power and splitting the alliance and weakening the, the sanctions. But another view potentially is that um, he's not naive, he's not just going to give away his nuclear program, but if he can trade away parts of the nuclear program and maintain some deterrence and then open up much more opportunity for a one-party rule, authoritarian government, but with you know major economic development and really play the, the improving the North Koreans' lives angle as the way to deal with that potential threat of, of concern about his people, that's a different, um, you know, more constructive outcome that maybe we can, we can work with. I don't, I don't know, this is, we might be ending on a note of, of what, what's your overall big picture take about, uh, about what's going on and what would Kim Jong-un's visit to Seoul tell you about his intentions in that regard? Kim Jong-un is a very different leader from his father or his grandfather. He's very educated, very smart, savvy. He knows how to play the media to his advantage. When he comes, if he comes to Seoul by year's end, as, as, as I said, all the TV cameras here will be in Seoul. Um, <laughs> and and it, it, it'll be a humongous you know, media, media event. Having said that, I think the real litmus test as a Korean, as speaking personally, is whether he will give up the cult of personality, whether the police state apparatus will be drawn down, whether the gulags will finally be eradicated. And if he does those three things on top of coming to Seoul, then yes, he will be another Deng Xiaoping. But unless and, uh, and until those three conditions are met personally, I think the old Kim Jong-un will still remain the old Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Any other? Okay. Uh, well, I hope that will be the case. I mean, you know, uh, obviously uh, he's now uh, going campaign uh, to make uh, North Korean people believe in that the uh, United States uh, could be a good friend, right? Mm -hmm. So in reality, sometime before he's uh, act, act the enemy, right? So a complete change of, of the domestic campaign education. So if his design uh, to get on the United States on board uh, for normalizing relationship, using this uh, nuclear card, play out. If the end goal is uh, to become a good friend without any nuclear weapon, that's the idea. I hope that will be the case. Thank you. I, I tend to agree with that. And Kim Jong-un is in his 30s. 
I'm sure he imagines decades of rule ahead of him. I think he understands probably what he needs to do in order to uh, maintain the continuation of the Kim dynasty under his leadership. So I think it's a proposition we shouldn't accept at face value, but we certainly should be testing it along the way. And more than testing it, we should be shape, helping to shape the outcome in a direction that moves that way. And again, when I think of how the U.S. is approaching North Korea, we're diplomatically, are we shape, helping to shape that outcome? It, the fact that he is selling this to his own domestic audience indicates a certain level of seriousness that we should be pursuing. But diplomatically, I think we, the U.S. is punching well below its weight. And we should be moving from maximum pressure to maximum engagement to make sure that outcome happens, not standing by idly and letting him. President Moon's doing a fabulous job, but uh, he should not be negotiating on our behalf. I can just close with that thought, too. I mean, we are confronting decades of hostile suspicion. I mean, North Korea is part of the axis of evil for around for a while. I mean, we, I think, owe the administration the benefit of the doubt for a while here. I mean, we have this opening. We have a new leader in North Korea. Are we <clears throat> right to be suspicious that maybe he's not going to do everything we want? I mean, I think... That's obvious. He's not going to do everything we want. He wants to hold on to power. Um, he's got a family dynasty legacy that he's protecting. But he has put himself out on a limb in a different way than previous leaders. And we owe it to humanity, to future generations, to test this for uh, as long as we can make it continue. And I think uh, the administration has a lot of credit for that. I do agree with Suzanne that we need to be doing a better job of implementing that kind of testing the opening, and I, I hope we'll get to that soon. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for coming down from Maine to join us and, <laughs> and to my other panelists. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Sasai, for, for all of your contributions to U.S.-Japan relations as, as ambassador and, and, uh, and for coming back and, and being with us today. We wish you much luck in your, uh, your new role. And, and thank you, General Air, for, for coming today and being a part of this whole event. And we wish you all much success in, in uh, managing peace uh, on, the, on the peninsula as well. Uh, my thanks to you all for, for joining us and those that supported uh, this event. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, here at Carnegie as uh, we, we, we keep track of, of developments on the Korean Peninsula and in the alliances. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you.